Good morning, everybody. Um, this is Betsy. Uh, today is, we were told, I was informed yesterday, I didn't know, that today is AML World Awareness Day. So um, I think we're very fortunate to be joined today for Ground Rounds by Dr. Edward Kalb, also known to most of us as Dr. Andy Kalb, and Dr. Todd Cooper. And just by way of a brief introduction, um, Dr. Kalb did his medical school training at Jefferson Medical College. He then followed that with a fellowship in Hemonc at Sloan Kettering, and also did a research fellowship in molecular pharmacology. He served on the faculty of Sloan Kettering, of Albert Einstein before he circled back to the Sidney Kimmel Medical College at uh, Thomas Jefferson, where he serves as a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and also serves as chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology at Nemers Alfred DuPont Hospital for Children, which is associated um, with uh, Thomas Jefferson. His leadership roles that he plays in the field are really literally too numerous to mention, or we would never get to grand rounds. So um, you can take a look at them on his at his CV, but um, they are numerous and they combine his expertise in clinical oncology, in molecular therapeutics and bioinformatics, biostatistics. And I have come to know him really through children's oncology uh, group. Since 2013, he has served as chair of the Myeloid Disease Committee. And um, I really thank you, Andy, for coming today. Dr. Todd Cooper, um, by way of introduction, did a DO at uh, Nova Southeastern University College of Osteopathic Medicine. He then followed that with a residency in pediatrics at the University of Southern Alabama, a fellowship in pediatric hematology oncology at MD Anderson, served on the faculty of the University of Alabama and at Emory University before in 2015, joining the faculty at the University of Washington, Seattle, um, whereas he is a professor of pediatrics at the Seattle Children's Hospital Cancer and Blood Disorders uh, Service. He's also a co-division director there. He has done, uh, I think, what was really uh, notable among all the other things that you've done, Todd, um, is the time and effort you've devoted to mentoring uh, fellows. Um, serving as mentors on K2 awards and many other research projects and watching those residence fellows and junior faculty come into their own. I think something that our department has really emphasized is the responsibility of the senior faculty to mentor and to watch you doing it um, at a much earlier stage is, uh, is terrific. Um, you're, uh, Dr. Cooper's uh, expertise in particular and interest um, surround novel approaches to therapy um, and new agents. And he's been a leader in many of the trials uh, in the Children's Oncology Group. And he is PI on the current pediatric de novo AML study, AAML 1831. So we're gonna start off with um, uh, Dr. Ander, Dr. Handy Cobb, um, who's going to give us a little bit of an overview of some of the things that have gone on in the Myeloid Disease Committee in COG. Thank you, Betsy, for that introduction. And, and please let me know if uh, there's any difficulty uh, seeing my screen or, or hearing any of us. Um, it's, it's really an honor to have an opportunity to, to speak to you today. Um, and it is World AML Awareness Day, uh, although we both became aware of that yesterday. Um, so, uh, but I, so I think this is timely. Um, you know, we're grateful for this opportunity, I think particularly because it gives um, Todd and I a, a chance to share um, with her department, how grateful we are for the opportunity to work with Betsy. And I think that one of the themes that we hope uh, will come out of this talk today is how um, uh, the work that, that Betsy does, that uh, Amy Beckman, uh, Kelsey McIntyre do, are really integral to uh, our strategic planning in uh, childhood AML and absolutely integral to the conduct of uh, clinical trials for, for children with uh, myeloid leukemias. Uh, none of the uh, presenters today have anything to disclose. Uh, 
Uh, we hope by the end of this uh, talk, you'll have a, a good understanding of the historical outcomes uh, for children with AML, some of the limitations of contemporary therapy. You'll be able to describe strategies um, for ongoing innovative therapies in children with AML and APL. Um, and then you'll be able to describe the integration of genomic and molecular data for risk stratification in our current uh, phase three trial. I'm gonna talk uh, about um, the, the Myeloid Disease Committee in, in the Children's Oncology Group covers uh, the, the range of myeloid malignancies that we see in children with AML, including a unique uh, subset of myeloid leukemia and Down syndrome, uh, APL, chronic myelogenous leukemia, as well as uh, de novo AML. We won't have a chance to talk today about, about relapsed AML, uh, but we will touch on these four uh, uh, topics. Before I do that, I would like to introduce you, for those of you who don't know, to the Children's Oncology Group. So the Children's Oncology Group is a member of the National Clinical Trials Network funded by the NCI. It's the only member uh, consortium uh, dedicated to pediatrics. And uh, it really is a, a, um, a worldwide uh, consortium. Uh, we have uh, also uh, conduct trials uh, in collaboration with European partners though they're not direct member institutions. Uh, in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand actually make up a significant proportion of the enrollments on um, uh, most of our uh, pediatric AML uh, phase three trials. In the United States, there are about 200 uh, research sites uh, throughout the US representing all of the states. Uh, and we estimate that about 90% of children who are diagnosed with cancer in the US will be cared for at one of our COG member sites. Um, for children with AML, we also estimate that about 70% of kids that are diagnosed with AML this year will be treated on the phase three trial that Todd and, and Betsy will talk about. This is not a, certainly not a population-based study, but pretty close to it. We, uh, we, we enroll a lot of kids and we think that participation in COG studies, particularly enrollment on these phase three trials, really helps facilitate the care of rare and complicated illnesses in, in children. And I think that uh, has a lot to say, uh, has a lot to do with um, uh, the aggressive enrollment that, that we're able to report enrollment rates. Con uh, cooperative groups like the Children's Oncology Group the, and the predecessors, the Pediatric Oncology Group and um, Children's, Children's Cancer Group uh, are credited for very rapid improvements in uh, survival in children with all malignancies, perhaps best exemplified by children with uh, ALL. Um, through the 60s and 80s with multi-agent chemo chemotherapy, the uh, use of, of um, uh, cranial um, uh, uh, prophylaxis for, for cranial leukemia, CNS leukemia, and um, improvements in supportive care, we saw a rapid improvement in, in survival. In my um, uh, lifetime as a pediatric oncologist, we've really seen more of a, of a plateau as we approach 90% uh, or greater than 90% survival for uh, some malignancies, including ALL. And over the past 20 years, we've really focused on a strategy of, uh, for, for diseases like ALL on targeted intensities, reducing therapy when appropriate and intensifying therapies when needed. Uh, and, and the introduction of targeted therapies as well. Uh, in the last decade, though not accounted for in this slide, we've also seen a, um, a very promising and exciting introduction of, of immunotherapies for children um, in relapse and now with, uh, with newly diagnosed uh, ALL. For some malignancies like AML, uh, the story is a little bit different. Uh, the plateau in survival that we've seen in the last 20 years is at a much lower uh, survival rate than what we see in ALL. And we got here really um, while providing maximally intensive therapy. Uh, improvements in survival have been related primarily to supportive care. And if you look at the major um, uh, findings, the major um, uh, improvements uh, that we've seen over the last uh, 50 years, Really, it, it has been a reshuffling of the, of the same agents, uh, reapplication of high-dose cytarabine and anthracyclines for children, um, better utilization of, of transplants with improved supportive care, both pre- and post-transplant that improve outcomes. And only just recently have we seen uh, the introduction of a 
novel therapy um, with uh, the use of gemtuzumab, ozogenlysin. Uh, I say novel because in, in quotes uh, because it was approved in, in 2018, though first tested in, in 1999 in, in children. So it does take a long time for these drugs to be approved. Uh, the last incremental improvement that we've seen in survival is in the trial uh, AAML0531. This was a randomized comparison of kids uh, getting conventional therapy with or without gemtuzumab. Um, this, the predecessor study did not show an improvement in survival. In fact, some children may have actually done worse in the more recent uh, AAML1031 trial, which uh, completed enrollment in, um, uh, in 2017. And it's important to note that this is despite the fact that we're giving 444 milligrams per meter squares, squared of anthracyclines, which is associated with about a 20% incidence of uh, left ventricular systolic dysfunction and uh, the administration of very high doses of cytarabine. And about a quarter to a third of these patients will get a transplant in, in first remission or did get a transplant in first remission on this study. So despite maximally intensive therapy, we really have uh, not seen uh, improvements in survival in children with AML for, for quite some time. And this comes in contrast to um, uh, adult AML where just in the last um, three years, we've seen five or six new drugs approved for uh, uh, older adults with, with AML. And I think that uh, highlights one of the, the take home messages for this morning, which is that Pediatric and adult AML are, are biologically distinct. And um, these, the, the top figure here is showing the incidence of, of um, gene fusions in blue and the incidence of uh, smaller uh, insertions and deletions in green. Uh, and the x-axis represents age. So you can see that uh, in younger children, particularly those uh, less than 10, um, uh, molecular fusions predominant uh, are predominant as the uh, perhaps the, the the driving event in their uh, AML with age and perhaps with an inflection in the adolescent young adult um, range. We see the accumulation, or we see the, the higher incidence of um, uh, smaller single nucleotide variants, small insertions and deletions. In the figure in the bottom, we're looking at the uh, TCGMA results on the on the right, and we're looking at the target pediatric AML um, uh, results on the left. Target was the NCI-funded initiative to look at uh, molecular sequencing in, in children. And I think what's striking about this is that you see the cascade of common mutations. These are just the single nucleotide mutations. Um, uh, and then we have the KDM5A and, and KMT2A fusions at the top. Um, that they're almost mutually exclusive. You know, where you see a, a, a mutation that's prevalent in kids, it's rare in adults. And where you see mutations like DN, DNMT3A um, uh, that are prevalent in adults, they're absent or very rare in, in children. Uh, and I think this is a, um, one of the limitations of drug development in children is that we have uh, very little overlap uh, with adults, which is the driver for drug development uh, and current driver for drug development in, in AML. Another limitation we have is that uh, we don't have a lot of patients. So we have done a lot of work over the last couple of years to uh, figure out mechanisms that a national clinical um, uh, trials network uh, group, funded group like the Children's Oncology Group can collaborate with Europeans uh, and just recently, with the support from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, uh, the European cooperative groups, there were more than eight just a few years ago, have reorganized into a single consortium. And we hope that that consortium will be able to collaborate more directly with the Children's Oncology Group to increase enrollment on um, clinical trials so that we may study rare molecular subsets of, of AML. I want to spend just a few minutes talking about uh, AML and Down syndrome. I'm sure Betsy and, and uh, Amy Beckman have shared some of their results previously, um, but I want to show the integral, um, use this to illustrate the integral role that um, our, our cytogenetics experts have played in um, understanding outcomes in children with Down syndrome. In um, AAML 
0431 is the predecessor study, uh, and it showed outstanding results with survival above 90 percent uh, for patients who are MRD negative, residual disease negative at the end of induction. We took an approach with the predecessor study with the next study, 1531, to reduce therapy by reducing exposure to high dose cytarabine. And unfortunately, we see with reduction in intensity, um, uh, we see it um, just like in the 1031, AML 1031 example, we see inferior outcomes. Um, and unfortunately as well, the uh, children who relapsed among the 12 children who relapsed, uh, it's very difficult to salvage them once they relapse. So in Down syndrome AML, therapy reduction without understanding any other biology associated with the leukemia uh, is not uh, feasible. Uh, what Betsy and Amy have been able to show is that perhaps there are patients we can identify at diagnosis who are more likely uh, to relapse during, if there's a ther uh, reduction in therapy. And here uh, we're seeing that among the patients who are MRD negative at diagnosis, so standard risk, they have um, are much more likely to relapse if they have complex cytogenetics, um, so greater than three structural abnormalities, um, uh, greater than three abnormalities, including one uh, at least one structural abnormality about a third, more than a third of the patients that relapse had uh, a complex karyotype. And this is, um, will hopefully be incorporated into um, uh, our strategy moving forward for Down syndrome. Where we have been successful in therapy reduction is in patients with acute promyelocytic leukemia. Again, a unique molecular subset of, of AML, as I'm sure many in this room are aware of. Historically, we have treated patients with APL with a combination of chemotherapy um, and then with the addition over the years of ATRA first and then arsenic trioxide. Um, with this, we see an event-free survival that is in excess of 95%, though we're still exposing patients to significant doses of uh, chemotherapy, including anthracyclines. But we also see that there are about one in 10 patients will die usually during induction due to um, uh, coagulopathy associated with APL. Uh, and these are primarily in patients with high risk APL, so patients with a higher weight count uh, at diagnosis. In um, 2013, the Germans and Italians published the results of the APL 0406 study showing outstanding outcomes with the elimination of chemotherapy in just standard risk patients. Um, uh, by using ATRA and arsenic trioxide in combination. Within the children's oncology group, we sought to uh, test whether this could be done in children. And uh, AML 1331 was a single arm, uh, historically controlled uh, trial of APL and arsenic trioxide in children with newly diagnosed uh, um, APL, including those with, uh, with high risk uh, APL. Though the patients with high risk APL seen here uh, received Ida Rubicin. This is one of our typical uh, schema, which can be very difficult to read. But I think the bottom line is that uh, we, we define risk based on initial white count greater than or less than 10,000. And patients with higher uh, risk AML get four doses of Ida Rubicin in induction. Um, and then the total duration of therapy is somewhere between. Uh, 34 to, to 40 weeks um, compared to uh, previous duration, which was closer to about two years. With this uh, regimen, we see that the event-free survival per patients with standard risk a, uh, APL uh, is 98% overall survival, 99% there was one early death. And the patients with high risk, these are the patients not included in the um, uh, AIDA study, uh, we see that uh, uh, event-free survival is 96%, overall survival is 100%, and this compares favorably to the combination approach that we, that we um, uh, reported previously uh, using ATO uh, ATRA in combination with, uh, with chemotherapy. Notably, there are no early deaths in the high-risk patients. So here we've demonstrated that um, we can reduce the cumulative exposure to chemotherapy for standard risk patients uh, to zero and reduce it significantly for high-risk patients, preserve event-free survival, um, and 
dramatically reduce the uh, early death rate with the use of a, a chemo-free uh, regimen in uh, standard risk and, and chemo light in uh, patients with, with high-risk disease. And the last realm that, that we oversee is that of um, uh, CML. Uh, CML is relatively rare in children, uh, representing about two to 3% of all leukemias. Uh, though we see dramatic improvements in survival with the use of lifelong uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, that comes at a great cost for children uh, with um, uh, CML. Uh, and that cost is, cost is measured in delays in growth and, and neurocognitive development. Uh, we plan to uh, mirror some of the approaches that have been recently successful in adults with CML to identify strategies to reduce TKI exposure. And the current trial, which is um, enrolling, uh, looks at um, uh, elimination of tyrosine kinases for patients that have chronic phase CML um, on any TKI for at least three years with a major molecular remission for at least two of those three years, uh, the most recent two of those three years. And we hope that we hypothesize that the treatment-free remission rate is gonna be around 40%. So though many patients will require additional um, uh, TKI or will require restarting of TKI, we hope that around 40 to 50% of patients will be, able, will be able to identify 40 to 50% of patients for whom no more TKI is exposure uh, is required. And for those patients that do require it, we'll be able to focus our future strategy on developing new interventions uh, uh, for them. And with that very brief overview, I want to pass it over to, uh, to Todd Cooper to talk about our um, phase three trial. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, Andy, and thank you so much to Betsy for inviting me to, to talk to all of you today. Uh, it's, it really is truly an honor, and I'm going to briefly talk about the current phase three randomized study for children and young adults with newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemia. Next slide. So I, I'm showing this uh, these two schemas of the last two AML phase three clinical trials for a couple of reasons. Um, number one is to show you how um, simple these studies were in comparison with the current phase three trial. Although you can see between the AML 0531 trial and the AML 1031, there is a bit of increased complexity, but also to highlight under each of the schematics, the um, the risk-defining lesions of high-risk, low-risk, and intermediate risk in AML 0531 and just high-risk and low-risk with the incorporation of minimal residual disease by central flow cytometry in AML 1031. I also want to highlight, uh, so when you look at these numbers, the first two numbers are what year these concepts were started. So you can see this is uh, 2005 and 2010. And as Andy mentioned, in those survival curves, we have not made all that much progress despite all our best efforts. And we're hoping to do better this time. I also want to highlight at the bottom of AML 1031 schema, um, the fact that there was the addition of serafinib, which is a um, FLT3 tyrosine kinase inhibitor for those patients with FLT3 ITD mutations. And although I won't have time to go into it here today, this arm of the trial did demonstrate significant improvements, um, demonstrating that FLT3 inhib inhibition is not only very important in adult AML, but also in, in children. Next slide. Um, next slide. So, uh, going from those other two schemas of the first two uh, of the last two phase three clinical trials, this is the um, overall schema for AML 1831. And we'll get into more detail about this, but you can see on the left, the primary randomization is between standard of care with the uh, introduction of uh, gemtuzumab, as, as Andy mentioned. Um, which did demonstrate in AML 0531, a significant advantage in event-free survival, and randomizing that against our agent of study, which is CPX351. 
And then on the right, not only are we studying um, a, a FLT3 inhibitor, a newer FLT3 inhibitor, which we'll get to later in these patients for FLT3 ITD patients, but due to biologic advances and discoveries, we've also uh, found a number of FLT3 non-ITD activating mutations that are uh, present in children, but are almost never present in adults. Going back to that slide to that uh, Andy mentioned before that pediatric and adult AML are biologically distinct. Next slide. So what were we thinking about in developing this last phase three trial? Well, initially what we really wanted to do was to have several um, different arms depending on the, the particular uh, mutation or fusions that um, patients were unfortunate enough to have uh, that were driving their AML. And, and it was a great design and I loved that design. Um, but unfortunately, and as Andy mentioned before, pediatric drug development is something that is lagging behind adult drug development. And we just did not have those targeted therapies available. So we definitely wanted to incorporate a new agent that was impactful and that had broad benefit for as many children as possible. We definitely wanted to incorporate the lessons learned from our prior phase three studies and even our prior phase one and two studies as well. We wanted to learn from these studies and improve upon our standards of care. So for example, it would be incorporation of gemtuzumab. And we wanted to incorporate advances in our understanding of the biology of childhood AML, for which Betsy has had a huge role um, in identifying risk stratifying lesions. Uh, and we wanted to incorporate targeted therapy when we could, which we are doing with a fluid three inhibitor. And finally, and Andy mentioned this, but cardiotoxicity is a devastating late effect for the children that have AML that survive their disease. And we wanted to try and maintain the intensity while improving the lives for these AML survivors. Next slide. So very briefly, uh, CPX351, also known as Vixios, is the drug under study uh, for this phase three trial. And um, while this is novel, it is still a liposomal encapsulation of the same two drugs that they've been using for AML since the 1970s, really. And so this is a cytarabine and donorubicin contained within a liposome at a ratio that has been shown to be optimal uh, between the cytarabine and the anthracycline and a number of preclinical studies. And there are definitely superior pharmacokinetic uh, properties uh, of looking at CPX351 versus free drug, which we don't have time to go into today. But the, in adult studies, it was superior to cytarabine and donorubicin as given as a free drug uh, in relapse and, and then in a, a subset of the highest risk patients for which this is now FDA approved. Next slide. So we did incorporate CPX351 in a clinical trial uh, for first relapse AML within the children's oncology group. Um, next slide. So what this trial was, was giving CPX351 in the first cycle of what we call re-induction therapy, followed by a second cycle of a high-dose cytarabine-based regimen. And what we found is that CPX351 was quite active in first relapse. And the recommended phase two dose is listed here, which is um, 35 uh, units higher than adults, uh, which goes to demonstrate that children can tolerate more intensive chemotherapy generally. And the complete response plus complete response without platelet recovery was 68%. And then what we call the overall response rate, which is CR plus CRP plus a, a CR with incomplete count recovery was greater than 80%. Um, and further, when we looked more into these responses, 80% of these that had complete responses had no residual disease as performed by flow cytometry. This was a quite an intensive regimen. Um, and, you know, very similar to other high-dose cytarabine-based regimens. And fortunately, 97% of those patients, so all but one patient, were successfully bridged to transplant with this therapy. And 78% of those patients had no detectable disease prior to transplant. So this was the best response rate published in COG study, um, and it warranted phase three study. Next slide. 
Next slide. So the primary objectives of this study, and this is taking just a little bit of a slice of, of the overall schema, and this is showing the primary randomization of CPX351 plus myelotard versus cytarabine and donorubicin uh, plus myelotard. And the primary objective is to compare the event-free survival between these two arms. Um, and this is for those without the FLIP3 mutations. And then the secondary objective is to compare the overall survival rate and the end of induction one, so the end of that first cycle, minimal residual disease rate, and this is performed in a central laboratory so that we have very clean results. Um, and MRD has is, is, uh, been shown to be probably the most important prognostic indicator in terms of event-free and overall survival. Next slide. So we um, have incredibly important secondary objectives linked with this study, one of which is this is providing us an outstanding opportunity to study our uh, cardiac outcomes in childhood AML and to compare a couple of different um, strategies for preventing this cardiotoxicity. Next slide. So as Andy mentioned, cardiotoxicity is really um, the primary issue that we're dealing with our, with our survivors. But what uh, Richard Applins, who is the principal investigator, demonstrated in, in Kelly Getz from um, the AML 1031 trial is um, not only is it a problem for those that survive, but those children who have significant left ventricular systolic dysfunction actually have uh, worse survival. And the way that that study dealt with anthracyclines and, and LVSD is that anthracyclines were removed from study. Um, and uh, the same doses of cytarabine were given. And what you can see here is that both the three-year event-free survival and the three-year overall survival were inferior in those patients that had left ventricular systolic dysfunction compared to those that did not. Um, and, and it's believed that these survival decrements are related to the higher relapse risk and also non-relapse mortality. So cardioprotection is critical to survival, and we need to come up with strategies to prevent LVSD. Next slide. So again, up to 25% of the of, um, cardiomyopathy incidences happens at, at 15 years of follow-up in children. And what this is showing is a comparison of um, echocardiogram and, and left ventricular systolic dysfunction between the last two phase three clinical trials. And, and the last clinical trial used the exact same dose of anthracycline than, than the previous, uh, but the rates were much higher. And that just goes to show you, if you look for something, you'll find it. So the echocardiogram and the cardiac monitoring was much more intensive. But importantly, the overall cumulative incidence of left ventricular systolic dysfunction, both on study and off study, was 20%. And so we needed to do much better, and um, and it does predict left and uh, it does predict uh, late uh, cardiac effects. Next slide. So what we're trying to do is compare two different cardio protective strategies um, in childhood AML. And I'm sorry, Andy, if you can go back to the previous slide. Um, what we what we did do in AML 1031 is we allowed for the cardio protectant dexazoxane. Uh, to be given. Um, and uh, what we did show is that those patients, and I believe, Andy, go to the next slide, please. And then the next, there it is. I'm sorry about that. Uh, those patients that did receive dexrazoxane had a significantly lower incidence of left ventricular systolic dysfunction compared to those that uh, did not receive dexrazoxane. It was not mandated on that study, but it was known to be um, a, a cardioprotectant, uh, and, and um, not that many patients used it as standard of care, but now we're requiring it on the next phase, on the current phase three. So, um, next slide. So, CPX351, uh, because of its liposomal delivery, also presents a promising strategy for mitigating this cardiotoxicity. It's, it's maintained for a longer period in, in the circulation, and so it doesn't go. Um, straight to the tissues. Uh, because of the size of this liposome, it does not cross the smallest capillaries and enter uh, the cardiac tissue, um, although we are not doing cardiac biopsies to prove that. 
uh, but that is um, felt to be the hypothesis. And it also is felt to have decreased drug resistance due to circumvention of drug levels. Um, so what we're actually doing is we are um, those in every anthracycline course, uh, other than CPX351, we're requiring dextrazoxane. Dextrazoxane is not given with CPX351 due to the very short half-life of dextrazoxane and the very long half-life of the uh, donorubicin within this liposome. Next slide. So Casey Ledger, who's in Seattle uh, and one of our younger faculty is, is leading these cardiac objectives. And, and so basically we're gonna compare the cardiotoxicity of CPX351 using serial echocardiograms and serial cardiac biomarkers. And then we're going to use this data, this really important data to try and determine if we can um, accurately predict very early on uh, LVSD and try to prevent it moving forward. Next slide. So um, very briefly, as we mentioned before, FLT3 inhibition has been shown to be an incredibly important targeted therapy, both in adults and now due to the last trial in children. And serafinib was the one that was used on the last clinical trial. And it's an excellent drug, but it wasn't even developed for uh, as a FLT3 inhibitor. It's a renal cell carcinoma drug because it does hit other targets. So we call it kind of a dirty inhibitor, um, which can result in a lot of off-target toxicities. Next slide. So we are going to be testing what is now an FDA-approved uh, newer FLT3 inhibitor, which is uh, much more potent and is much more specific to FLT3 inhibition. It's a dual inhibitor of FLT3 and Axel. Um, and also importantly, it has activity against the FLT3 ITD mutations as well as the tyrosine kinase domain mutations, and it's FDA approved for both. It does definitely have less off-target side effects than serafinib. And the panel on the bottom right shows the randomized phase three trial demonstrating a, a survival advantage of gilteritinib over um, chemotherapy alone and those that had any kind of flip through mutation. And on the left, uh, Sohail Mashinchi and Catherine Tarlock in Seattle um, have done quite a bit of work and have identified other activating mutations not in the internal tandem duplication domain. The D835 is common in adults, but many of these other activating mutations aren't found in adults at all. Um, and so we are uh, going to be testing for these activating mutations and offering participation for those that um, have these mutations to receive gilteritinib on top of their standard chemotherapy. Next slide. So this is what uh, arms C, which is for the FLT3 inhibitors, and arm D actually look like. Uh, we're also going to be offering gilteritinib maintenance after bone marrow transplant or after the end of chemotherapy. Next slide. So um, I definitely wanted to mention that we have taken the lessons learned from the last few phase three clinical trials, not only in the United States, but in uh, Europe as well, to optimize that standard of care. Um, and that arm A, uh, so to speak. Next slide. So these are all the changes, or some of the changes really, um, in the standard of care arms and demonstrating what we've learned from our other trials. So we've eliminated one drug from induction, uh, atopicide, and this is based on Medical Research Council in the UK trial where they actually randomized in the first block citerabine and donorubicin versus citerabine, donorubicin, and atopicide and showed no difference. So we have removed that, but we have added gemtuzumab, which was shown to be efficacious uh, in um, AML0531. We're going to discuss, and Betsy's going to discuss at length, um, revisions to the risk stratifying lesions uh, and subsequent risk group stratification. We are using dextrazoxane in all the anthracycline containing cycles except CPX351. And importantly, and I didn't, I should have shown you this um, when we compared the AML0531 and 1031. AML 1031 only gave four cycles of chemotherapy, where 0531 gave five, and this was due to a late randomization in that same MRC study, which demonstrated that there was no benefit to that fifth cycle. But um, AML 1031, as Andy demonstrated in one of his early slides, actually, those kids overall did um, 
worse than they did in 0531. So we looked into that and felt that it was due to the elimination of that fifth cycle, which had very high dose cytarabine. At the same time, we did find that there was a group of the lowest risk patients that did just as well with four cycles than they did with five cycles. And these were our core binding factor leukemias and our CEPB alpha and nucleophosmin mutations. And those that were MRD negative, they did just as well um, with four cycles than five. So now we're going to have three risk groups, as, as uh, I'm going to show you in the next slide, as well as um, Betsy's going to show you guys. Next slide. So um, I, I do want to briefly mention the biologic discoveries from prior trials that have had a major impact in this trial and are really um, driving what I consider to be the most important part of this trial, which is the um, multifaceted risk determination on this study. Next slide. So again, just a very, very brief reminder, and not only the simplicity of these trials, but also um, the relatively small numbers of risk-defining lesions for each of the last two trials. Um, next slide. And this is what it looks like now. So through really, honestly, um, much of Betsy's work with our patients and, um, and her cytogenetics and FISH work, as well as um, work done by Sohail Mashinchi in the U.S. and others around the world looking at RNA and DNA sequencing and looking at these abnormalities and seeing how each group of these patients did in terms of survival. We have greatly expanded the number of risk-defining lesions, and unfortunately, that expansion has mainly taken place um, in, in our unfavorable prognostic markers. Um, and it is going to take our high-risk patients from about 25% uh, uh, to 30% of our patients and increase this up to approximately 50% when we go back to the last phase three trials. And that's what we're seeing about uh, 125 patients in, where at about 50% of the patients are high-risk. Um, give it one click, please, Andy. So now we have three risk groups, the low risk one, which is our lowest risk patients who are MRD negative, our low risk two patients, they receive five cycles of chemotherapy and they don't have either unfavorable or favorable prognostic markers. And then our high risk patients will receive three cycles of chemotherapy and transplant. Next slide. But how do we determine these different risk classifications? And this is what Betsy's going to go into and it's what I'm most proud of with this clinical trial is this um, central review of a number, actually eight different um, uh, risk-defining uh, tests. Um, and uh, Matthew Cutney, um, who has a computational brain, has developed this risk matrix where, um, and Betsy will go into this more, where results from a number of different molecular tests, uh, DNA and RNA sequencing, and very importantly, uh, fish and cytogenetic results are, are entered into this matrix and are overseen by uh, Betsy and her group, and, um, and then it spits out a risk classification into either R LR1, LR2, and high risk. And again, I can't uh, say enough how important Betsy has been and her group have been in, um, in putting this all together. And it's been an incredibly valuable tool, not only for the study, but for patient care, and I, and I do believe that it's going to be incredibly uh, important moving forward. Next slide. So um, thank you so much uh, for having me and also to the study committee and the concept committee, and, and thanks so much to Betsy and her group um, for this incredible work. Okay, thank you very much. Todd, thank you very much, Andy, um, for saying those very nice things. It's been a terrific uh, project and study to be involved in. Um, I've learned a tremendous amount um, about a lot of different things. So I'm going to discuss specifically the integration of molecular cytogenetic cytogenomic data for risk stratification. Next slide. Um, as Todd said, AAML 1831, this de novo AML study, is unique 
to the COG protocols and providing upfront integration of molecular and cytogenetic cytogenomic data for risk stratification. So this is all being done in real time. It's not something where we look at the data later and kind of, you know, uh, think about what was uh, happening. Importantly, the study is designed to have confirmation of all of the genetic calls other than the FLT3 internal tandem dupe by at least two methodologies. And that might be conventional cytogenetics fish, molecular DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, flow in particular for the so-called RAM immunophenotype, um, which primarily associates with one of the particular high risk uh, factors. Next slide. So the cytogenetics committee or the group that is um, merging these data led by myself. Um, and then there's Kelsey McIntyre from our department and Gordana Rocca from uh, Children's Hospital of LA. And so what do we actually do? Um, we review the cytogenetic data that's received directly from the institution's cytogenetic laboratory. For some, that's the local lab, and others use a reference laboratory. By day 10, there is a panel of fish that's required. By day 14, all of the supplemental data, which I'm going to show you. And then we retrieve the data from foundation medicine and molecular oncology and integrate molecular and cytogenetics, resolve any discrepancies by going back to the individual labs, maybe asking them to do some more work, asking them to fish. Sometimes um, our lab here will back up um, some work to find something and people will send us specimens and then we will do some additional fish because people, other uh, institutions don't have access to those probes. And then we will enter the integrated data into a central um, review form and to be utilized in the risk stratification algorithm um, that was put together by Dr. Cutney, which has 64 different uh, cells, possible cells for this data to go into. So in the next slide, this is just to show you what happens to a specimen. Um, so specimens are sent to the local cytogenetics laboratory, which is in the upper right hand. Um, Andy, if you can kind of just highlight that. They will have, um, yes, they have a set of probes and these probes were determined uh, by myself and Susanna Ramundi, um, who worked on the previous uh, studies with me, um, as being what we felt were the critical uh, fish probes that should be run up front. We have many uh, clinicians at our institution, and we've heard this from others, that based on where they train, they may say, I want you to run an AML fish panel for me, or an ALL fish panel for me, or an MDS fish panel. And sometimes those panels have 20, 30 probes on them. But in point of fact, um, over time, we've learned a great deal from these studies, and we really don't feel that that's necessary. We focused in on KMT2A, previously known as MLL, because it has many different partners and has a pretty high percentage of cryptic um, rearrangements that you can only see by fish uh, in AML. And then NUP98, I think that our study is the first study, the COG study, to, or actually of any study that I know, to require upfront fish with this particular probe. And as was shown in previous slides, this is another one of these genes that can take multiple partners um, and plays a significant role within uh, AML. All NUP98 rearrangements, we believe at this time, are high risk, unlike KMT2A, where really the partner um, determines whether or not that particular fusion is high risk. And I just want to give a shout out to uh, Molly Lynch and Leanne Oseth, who are two people who work in my research core facility that I have for the Cancer Center and to the Masonic Cancer Center, because many laboratories did not have NUP98 up and running. Um, it, again, is um, not a probe that has been called on before. And so we provided actually uh, preparations for those laboratories they, uh, to be able to do their validations um, and get those probes up and running. So we've been doing mentoring of labs along the way, which we hope will also just improve care for patient care in the future, regardless of whether they're COG um, regardless of whether they're pediatric or adult, NUP98 and KMTA are found in uh, adult and peds. And then the two fusions, the RUNX1, T1, RUNX1, which is the 821, and the CBF beta, MYH11, which is the inversion 16. These are the two uh, low-risk um, fusions that Taja showed you. 
So those data are done by the local lab. Um, Foundation Medicine, which is, uh, is doing a, a whole panel of fusions, again, um, using DNAs and using RNA-seq to all of these are what we consider to be um, prognostic indicators, meaning that the only ones that are included in this panel that Foundation Medicine is doing are those that would actually slate a patient for either high risk or for low risk. Anything in between, for example, there's even a KMT2A that's in there, um, a 911 doesn't actually make it to prognostic because it doesn't um, stratify a patient for high or for low risk. Then there's molecular oncology, which is run out of um, Fred Hutch um, and this is Sohail Mishinchi. And they do the FLT3 internal tandem duplication as well as mutations for NPM1 and CEBPA BZIP mutations. And then also a specimen goes to uh, hematologics where they look at specifically immunophenotype um, at diagnosis and also are responsible for looking at um, minimal residual disease um, after induction. So when I first looked at this protocol, I thought, and when we were planning, I thought, oh, this is never going to happen. Specimens are going to go to all these labs and actually we're going to get all this data and put it into the, into the database and resolve any discrepancies in real time. I mean, when you think about it, um, it's really a tremendous undertaking, but the fact is that it all has worked and it is continuing to work. So um, if you go to the next slide. So again, uh, just some examples of what might go under a low risk one um, or a low risk two. And you can see that even though sometimes like in the low risk two, there's the A21 translocation, RUNX1, T1, RUNX1, but if you have an exon 17 kit mutation along with it, then you become a low risk two. And again, this has led to things that I think about as we move forward at our institution, should we be pairing an exon 17 kit mutation with the RUNX1, T1, RUNX1 as its own kind of entity? Um, next slide. So um, there are forms that have been created and approved. Um, there's a lot of approval processes in COG. Um, and this is a very straightforward, the, C, the CRA, these clinical research associates who do a phenomenal amount of work for this study, give to their lab or send to their lab the actual form. And then the lab fills it out as to whether or not there's positive or negative for those four fish probes. The next slide. And so here is an example of a NOOP98 uh, fish. So again, for probe for genes that take multiple partners like KMT2A or NOOP98, the best type of probe to look for a rearrangement is a so-called break-apart probe where you have um, the gene itself, the five prime region and the three prime region labeled in different colors uh, in red and green. And so if you have an intact uh, gene where it's not rearranged, you should see overlapping uh, red and green as you do where that yellow arrow is at about five o'clock. And if NUP98 is rearranged and has a partner, you don't know what the partner is from this fish, but you know that it's rearranged, then you're going to see separation of that red and green signal as you do with the red and green arrows. Next slide. So then at by day 14, so the fish data is entered. By day 14, the laboratory submits to us um, their G-banded results, and that means that they don't, they send us the actual images, um, of, and then those are reviewed um, by the Cytogenetics Committee. They tell us what they think the karyotype is, and then we review it and make any revisions as necessary. So in this particular case, I've circled um, areas where we revised the karyotype, um, they felt that there was uh, something on the top of seven, chromosome seven, um, which is circled in red. And uh, I actually felt that this was uh, a two seven translocation. And then that small marker chromosome in the very low left labeled as M, I felt was a deleted 13. So if you look in the next slide, after the cytogenetics data, the G-banded data is review. Um, you can see in purple where I made some revisions to that karyotype. And I think um, in a, this central review of cytogenetics is also really essential. 
um, to really define the karyotype. It's not all that different than what I hear about in, uh, in hematopathology about a consensus conference. Um, but this is going on between us and the uh, individual lab and communication is usually excellent. Um, the labs have been terrific. Um, I will give them feedback on what I've done to their karyotype or, and uh, be open to discussion on it and also ask for additional materials as needed. Sometimes that might include fish and sometimes actually microarray. Next slide. So in this particular case, we saw that the fish was the, showed us that there was rearrangement, but, and you don't have to go back and show the slides, but when you actually looked at the G-band chromosomes, there was no abnormality of 11P, which is where NUP98 resides. So what then is done is actually fishing onto G-banded chromosomes or, and in a sequential manner. And we could see that where we would expect the intact signal was on the normal chromosome 11. And we knew that one part of NUP98 was going to be on the abnormal 11, but what we were really looking for was the partner. What was the partner in this translocation? And it actually went to 12P. So that was actually um, an excellent um, finding because when Foundation Medicine came back, they said that they actually, in their high risk, they showed that there was a NUP98 KDM5A fusion and KDM5A maps to 12P. So this was again a concordant result. Next slide. Um, and this just shows you kind of how the foundation reports extracted from there um, showed us that there was a NUP98 uh, fusion present. And then they had a follow up report that showed the partner. Next slide. So this case demonstrates the contributions and integration of genetic data. The cytogenetics showed the structural rearrangements generating the critical gene fusion and the overall complexity of the karyotype and confirmed the molecular findings. And you might say, well, is that any even important? Um, we think it, it may well be in some cases, yes, maybe in other cases, no. But one thing that we're looking for is complexity of karyotype in addition to the primary abnormalities and also to look for associations between the primary and other secondary abnormalities as either of those could be potentially targetable. And then the molecular show the specific fusion. Next slide. So if we look at, as of now, there were 110 patients enrolled. This study just started last uh, July and um, the number that have been enrolling has been increasing. Um, we can see that there was, there's actually great concordance between these different methods. Discordant results only in two of the first 86, and now there's a third discordant. And interestingly, it's exactly the same discordance that we saw. The uh, molecular picked up an MLLT10 PCAM fusion, um, which was not seen by G-banding. Um, it was cryptic. And then there was a deletion of ETB6 and 12P seen by FISH um, and G-bands, but not by uh, Foundation Medicine. So I think what we're looking at is the fact that the different combinations of techniques um, really each contribute something different. They back each other up um, and we're learning about all of it. For example, the fact that the second case we have has an MLLT10 rearrangement and an ETB6 deletion may mean that these two are closely associated and may then go back to people like Todd and to um, Andy for discussion about, you know, what different pathway and what potential targeted therapy. Next slide. So this is just a kind of a summary that 1831 and other COG cooperative trials enables advances not only in treatment, which is the primary goal, but also in advancing basic science Many of the findings can be applied to adult, um, to patients in cooperative groups, um, as well as non. I mean, we've struggled for so long to have integrated reporting here, and we've not been able to do it, to merge our heme path with our flow, with our cyto and molecular. Um, maybe it's because we're depending on text uh, types of reports. Should we have a database, empty that data in there as it comes available, and then convert to something like a short text report? I think the other thing I really want to emphasize is that this has been a truly joyful experience and that I've learned a lot about leadership from Andy Kalb because he has 
runs a really inclusive um, group. Everybody uh, has a say and he clearly acknowledges and values all of the contributors. And from uh, Todd, uh, because he keeps all of this together, <laughs> he is really on top of everything. We have weekly meetings, monthly meetings, um, and there's just a lot of support, both from the administration of COG, as well as from the laboratories and the clinicians. And then in the last slide, this is also, it's AML Awareness Day, but it's lab week. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the work of the individual cytogenetics laboratories, in addition to the staff of the laboratories of Foundation Medicine, Molecular Oncology, and Hematologics. And I wanna say very, very, much thank you to Todd and to Andy for really allowing um, us to participate in the study in this way that we do, and also for coming today and helping with Grand Rounds. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. And thank you, Drs. Cooper and Kolb. We do not have time for questions as we're going to Q&A. Thank you very much. Good job. We will see you all soon. Take care. Thanks, everyone.